great. Looks like we're able to be live on YouTube now. All the IT is working. Thanks for your patience, Beth. Okay. Wonderful. We have a good crowd today. <laughs> Happy Friday. <laughs> or whichever day it is for you. Um, I'll wait one more minute. We'll start at 3.05. Hi, Norma. All right, should we begin Chelsea and Fran and Judy? Cool, wonderful. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for the last plenary of the Global Coral Reef Week. I am Dr. Beth Lenz, a coral biologist, a fellow coral biologist. Um, I recently finished my PhD from the University of Hawaii at Manoa at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, studying coral bleaching, reproduction, and breeding. I'm currently a Marine Policy Fellow in Washington, DC, working on ocean and wildlife issues in the House Committee for Natural Resources, so that's very exciting. I have the incredible Dr. Chelsea Council supporting us today on the technical side, and she is currently a postdoctoral research scientist at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, focusing on informing marine resource management strategies across the state of Hawaii by modeling coral reef ecosystem responses to biophysical oceanographic processes and various human impacts. And she is also a core organizer of Global Coral Reef Week. During this session, please use the chat to introduce yourselves. And please be sure, I'm noticing some people are doing this, um, please be sure to include um, in the two, uh, all panelists and attendees. Make sure it's not just to the panelists so everyone can see it. After the final plenary, we are going to have a Q&A session. So when you want to participate, you'll go to the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and enter your questions in that Q&A chat box that you'll find right there at the bottom, especially if you put your cursor over the Zoom screen. Uh, participants can vote on the questions so you can prioritize and put them at the top um, if you would like to hear that question and hear our responses and answers. If there are any technical difficulties um, and you happen to be the only one, uh, you can definitely exit and then sign back on. Uh, this is also being streamed on YouTube live, so you can go there and watch as well. You just won't be able to enter in your questions. And then to get started, we'd like to survey our audience today. Um, our first poll that we'll be putting out is about where you are from, so in your location. So please take a moment to respond. Ooh, I see data coming in. Great. Ninety percent voted. So we have the majority is from North America. We have South America, Mesoamerica, Europe, Caribbean as well. Thank you all for joining us today. And then our second poll that we'd like you to respond to is what sector are you from or come from? 
And I know as scientists, we come from multiple levels of this as well. We wear a lot of hats. Oh, hi, Madeline. <laughs> Great. So we can probably share that. It looks like everyone's responded. And it looks like most are coming from academia. And then we have students, so glad to have you here. Um, conservation and management, wonderful. Government, yes. Tourism, awesome. Education and other. Thank you so much. All right, we can close that out. All right, uh, it is now my pleasure and honor to introduce to you all Dr. Judy Lang. Uh, Dr. Judith Lang has dedicated her life's work to coral reefs in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean and some of her major contributions to the field includes understanding how corals compete for space. She has been engaged with the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment Protocols and Surveys since it was established in the mid 1990s. Uh, and uh, she currently, and since 2005, she has served as the AGRA's science coordinator and along with her colleagues developed many of the programs, instructional and training materials. Currently they have over 1600 standardized surveys, I believe. She knows the exact number, she just sent it to me yesterday. Uh, very impressive and unfortunately COVID has limited the ability to access the reef at the moment. After the spread of a devastating stony coral tissue loss disease, also known as SCTLD, from Florida to the Northern Caribbean in 2018, her efforts have been concentrated on helping regional colleagues understand, identify, and respond to the disease. She collaborates with diverse uh, response efforts and is a co-lead of the Florida Disease Advisory Committee's Caribbean Cooperation Team. She is also one of the organizers of this week's Global Coral Reef Week. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Judy Lang and hear from her why she still has hope. Please take it away, Dr. Lang. Thank you, Beth. Greetings, everyone. This is Judy Lang junior co-organizer of the Global Coral Reef Week, and what a pleasure to speak with you this afternoon. I'm a Canadian with a good fortune to have grow up in Jamaica when its reefs were world renowned for their lush beauty and scuba was a novelty. And so I became a coral biologist, of course. At that time, Tom Garo Sr. was one of the first marine scientists uh, I can't advance the slides, Beth. Can you stop sharing the results? Are you trying, can you try the sideways as well as the up and down arrow just to make sure? Oh my goodness. Maybe if you um, stop screen share and then try sharing again. There's also two little arrows at the bottom in the picture. Coming back, share. Perfect. Share. Yeah. What's happening? So we, yeah, we see your PowerPoint up right now, just not in presenter mode yet. Well, it says, stop. It says I'm screen sharing. Yes, now I see it. You see it now? Yes, that's perfect. Try it again. Then, What's happening? No, it's still not advancing. And then Fran had mentioned, if you look down on the bottom left-hand corner, there's a little arrow. Can you try clicking on that? Ah, all right, I'll take that. Ah, perfect, awesome. Thank you, sorry, sorry to be so disorganized. We've had lots of- <laughs> I think the IT is a fun challenge and we're, we're doing what we can. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> okay, uh, when I started diving, Tom, can we get rid of the pole sector? Are you still seeing that? Okay, I got rid of it, I hope. Um, Tom Gross Sr., one of the first marine scientists to use scuba, was performing cutting edge research on deep reefs. He led a group that discovered exciting new species of benthic algae, 
like the calcareous halomita on the left, coralline sponges that were previously unimagined in the middle, like the stromatospongia, stony corals and other creatures. So why do I have hope? I have hope because our universe is constantly changing. And so is our sun. Because planet Earth changes, as does life on Earth. So here's a quick summary of changes in scientists' ideas about the complexity of life. In 1840, it was shown as two independently diversifying shrubs, plants with a flowering queen palm tree and animals with a man for king. Charles Darwin by then was already imagining what we would now call the biological tree of life. And you can see his first sketch on the left. By 1866, oh, now I can't reach the advance. All right, go do something. Here we go. By 1866, the protists, which are mostly single celled organisms and their relatives, had joined plants and animals in a single tree. When I was an undergraduate in Jamaica, Photosynthetic protists were in botany, heterotrophic protists were in zoology, and some were in both departments and we had to learn different names in each. Microbiology was in a third department where only the medical students had to learn about microbes. But an explosion in technology was already occurring. And it was giving rise to the revolutionary understanding that there are two very different levels of cellular organization. We now know that prokaryotes are living organisms that lack a nucleus. And it turns out that what we call blue-green algae in the protists were really prokaryotic cyanobacteria. And prokaryotes themselves consisted of two domains, bacteria and archaea, that usually look alike, but they have very substantial differences in some of their genes, metabolic pathways, and in the biochemicals that they produce. Eukaryotes are everything else, plant, protists, plants, and animals. We all have cells with well-defined nuclei, plus other organelles. And by 1990, a tree with bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes that was based on molecular RNA data implied that we're all somehow related. And that's because some of our eukaryotic genes and enzymes seem to be derived from the archaea, while our my mitochondria and the chloroplasts in the photosynthetic eukaryotes seem to have evolved from some free living bacteria that become mutualistic symbionts in our ancestral eukaryotic cell as is evoked on the lower diagram. So I have hope in nature. So con consider corals. If I can advance the slide. Here's a simple diagram. Populations of zooxanthellae, single-celled photosynthetic dinoflagellates that live in symbiosis with many marine vertebrates, are abundant in the endodermal cells of some shallow corals. And Tom Gurrow's cutting edge physiological research over 60 years ago first proved that zooxanthellae greatly enhanced the calcification rates of their hosts in the light during the day compared to their growth rates in the dark at night or in corals that naturally lack these symbionts. These, their photosynthetic pigments provide the yellow-brown colors of many reef corals, like this important Caribbean framework builder, Orbicella annularis. Now, zooxanthellae were once considered a single species, and then the ones in stony corals were segregated as a new genus, Symbiodinium, and then a few other species of Symbiodinium were gradually described on the basis of morphological and other characters. And then, whoa, molecular taxonomy came along, uh-oh, and that didn't work. Um, so we won't look at it um, because uh, a huge number of clades were suddenly being recognized on the basis of differences in their RNA. And in, as the RNA from the symbionts in more corals and more places was extracted, um, 
it was discovered that they varied enormously among coral species and among uh, geographic locations uh, in, in, within any ocean system. And so two years ago, lots of molecular and morphological information was combined in a new classification. The pink star here is the original Symbiodinium microadriaticum from clade A near the base of the Symbiodiniaceae, as this family is called, family tree. Six more genera corresponding to the clades B to G were described, and there are promises of more to come. A few of the anticipated hundreds of new species have now been named too. These different genera and species also vary in important functional characteristics. For example, during thermal warming events, the bleaching susceptibility of a coral is often regulated by the physiology of its dominant symbiont. Juristinium trenchi of the former clay D, that red star, is a stress tolerant Indo-Pacific alga that's thought to have inv invaded the Caribbean and it increases greatly in abundance, at least temporarily after bleaching events. But when Orbicella fabulata, the coral in the upper right, were experimentally exposed to different temperatures in Mexico, corals with this symbiont, which are shown in the graph as those red bars, calcified less quickly than similar colonies containing their usual symbionts, which are indicated as these yellow, green, and blue bars. Modern technology is also upsetting our understanding of coral relationships and diversity. For example, or example molecular analyses of the soft tissues in some Indo-Pacific and Atlantic members of two important uh, families of massive corals with skeletal features that look very similar when seen at the dissecting microscope le level, um, probably really represent morphological convergence and not close family relationships. And this interpretation is reinforced by details of their skeletons that are revealed when you look at them at, at higher magnifications. Um, for example, on the septal teeth that are shown under scanning electron microscopy in the center of this slide. And in the transverse electron micrographs uh, showing the mic that reveal the microstructure of their calcification centers and fibers, which you can see on the right. Now, after a huge amount of work, a revised classification is being proposed uh, in which the molecular and the morphological data are integrated. As shown here for the three clades that were illustrated in the last slide and a bunch of others as well. One major finding is that genera in the traditional favored and mussid families are now merged into one family that is restricted to the Western Atlantic. That means its corals are genetically far more distinct from those in the Indo-Pacific than was previously thought, when some genera had species in both ocean systems, which is very significant in terms of biodiversity conservation. And it's wonderful that we now have this additional insight into their evolution. And again, there are many more changes yet to come, including a suggestion that there may be over 1,200 species of Acropora in the Indo-Pacific, of which maybe two thirds are yet to be described. Of course, bacteria and other microbes also occur in stony corals. The layer of mucus overlying the epidermis on the left is a, it is a defense against biofouling and invading organisms. So there are resident bacteria here, which have been taken from coral mucus that produce antimicrobial compounds that could inhibit the growth of some of the, of some invading bacteria. 
And bacteriophage viruses are also present in the mucus, and they may serve as an additional defense for the coral host. The bacterial diversity of the zooxanthellae in reef corals is enormous, and much of it is novel to scientists. Its composition changes with the seasons or when a coral's own requirements change. And when corals are diseased, large shifts occur that of course also vary among the coral species. So shown here is the beta diversity of bacteria that were extracted in a mix of mucus and underlying tissue samples collected from four of the coral species that are affected by stony coral tissue loss disease or SCTLD in the Florida Keys in June, 2018. Those green squares are for healthy looking corals in an area that is vulnerable to attack but hasn't yet experienced the disease. They are very distinct from bacteria in all the other corals sampled in the Stephanosini intercepta here in the upper left, but in the Deploria labroformis on the upper right, they're not quite so distinct, but they are separated and they're all mixed up in the Dickasini of Stokesi. Uh, samples. These purplish triangles represent the beta diversity of bacteria at the lesion front where coral tissues are dying, and they differ from all the others, overlapping only with the blue looking samples from healthy regions of the uh, healthy looking regions of the same disease colonies in Dicosinia. Stokes eye. Uh, time doesn't permit continuing for all the other types of, uh, of uh, results discovered when these tissues were sampled, but you get the point. There's an enormous amount of genetic diversity in any corals, microbial associates. So I have hope for shallow reefs as ecosystems because nature has a lot of genetic resources to draw upon during times of diversity. And I have hope for shallow reefs as ecosystems. Stromatolites are layered structures that form in shallow water when trapped sediment grains are cemented by mats of cyanobacteria and other microbes. Although rare now and restricted to special environments like this subtidal channel in the Bahamas, stromatolytic reefs have been around for the last, oh, 350 billion years. And some of their aggregate structures in the past were huge. The photo of a 14, 1.4 billion years old uh, stromatolit formation in China on the upper right was taken at a deposit that is 100 meters thick. So it accreted over a very long period of time. And during the Paleozoic era, Stromatoporoid sponges on the left had calcareous skeletons, and they are thought to have lived between about 480 and 360 million years ago, at which time they were important reef builders. Well, it turns out they aren't quite extinct after all. Without our first knowing what we were looking at, Astrosclero williana, a living stromatoporoid shown in the center left, occurs in caves and on shaded walls of the Indo-Pacific. The oldest corals come from about 470 million years ago when the colonial tabulates on the right and the rugose corals in the middle first appeared. Rugoses were either solitary or colonial and some were endosymbionts in stromatoporoids. See the fossil on the lower left. Along with the stromatoporoids, some tabulate corals were important reef constructors in shallow water, especially from about 440 to 416 million years ago. And it's actually thought that these tabulates perhaps engaged in symbiosis with some kinds of zooxanthellae. So the tabulates that were building these gray mounds in the diorama on the lower right provided habitat space for a diverse array of both familiar looking like sponges and strange creatures, like those uh, cones with orange polyps on their top, 
which is how the Mugos corals have been represented uh, appearing in life in this reconstruct in this uh, in this diorama. So turning now to the Scleractinians, our kinds of stony corals. Stony corals that lack zooxanthellae have been around for at least the last 245 million years, appearing in the middle Triassic period. And they perhaps even earlier, they, and they perhaps evolved even earlier from soft body Paleozoic cnidarians. Fossils of what are presumed to have been zooxanthellate stony corals also extend almost as far back in time. So they've been around long enough to have survived several periods of intense climatic change. Uh, that gives me hope for tropical reefs that this kind of complex symbiosis that we know of microbes, photosynthetic protists, and sedentary animals that flourish in naturally warm sunlit seas is just too efficient a lifestyle not to persist. And I'm optimistic that even if much diminished, our stony corals could outlast what some may call the Anthropocene, if only we could clean Earth's oceans. And even today, in the wreckage that we see on modern coral reefs, we have lots yet to learn. Consider pacinellids. They are photosynthetic crustose red algae that are not crustose coral and algae. And you can see how different they look in these photographs. As corals have died, pacinellids that we had never imagined before have emerged from unknown hiding places. Most have very thin calcareous skeletons and some look just beautiful but they are expanding across reef surfaces, killing and growing over corals and CCA as shown here, plus lots of other sedentary benthic creatures. Our reefs are still changing. Nevertheless, I remain hopeful because individuals inspire me, like Greta Thunberg, the world's most accomplished advocate for reducing CO2 emissions. All those scientific and medical research who've researchers who've scrambled to understand and are now trying to invent a vaccine for the novel pandemic-inducing virus. And I'm inspired by our GCRW virtual organizers, Francisca Elmer and Chelsea Council. We were in shutdown just a few months ago and our concept of having remote dispersed local coral reef meetings this July was in jeopardy. When they just pivoted to host a global virtual GCRW meeting, figuring out how to do so as they organized everything. And all I could contribute was some cheering from the sidelines. I rejoice in their accomplishment. And of course, I'm inspired by all of you who are participating, especially our plenary speakers and by those many dozens of you who accepted the challenge of contributing your own research talks to GCRW on very short notice. Thank you all so much. And now to pivot to end on a more serious note. Earlier this spring, I had an idea about connecting the reef community to the engineers, chemists, agronomists, inventors, and so on, who are addressing the real drivers of reefs decline. I was trying to get them invited to our meetings to explain what they do. I thought that by giving them some prominence and good publicity, we promote those whose work is reducing the excess carbon emissions, sediments, nutrients, and other pollutants that we reef scientists routinely lament, but really do nothing to reverse. That we'd establish new networks and that our connections to those who fund activities like reef restoration that are more visually attractive to funding organizations would help further advance their efforts which in turn would help our corals resist the stressors that continue to contribute to their demise. But then came COVID-19. As we who are privileged endured the shutdown, like many others, it seems, I despaired at the vulnerability of the poor who in the US, where I now live, um, predominantly are brown and black people. 
They were deemed providers of essential services and had to continue working, often without proper care for their own children, and with inadequate protective clothing, with health care that was often insufficient at best. And consequently, they were also dying at rates disproportionate to those of us far more safely shut up in our homes. And then a white policeman who calmly and slowly strangled a civilian lit a worldwide flame of peaceful protest against racial injustices. Seeing the speed in which people in many levels of business and government and the rest of society, except of course the present White House in the US, are already responding to their newfound understanding of what systemic injustice really means for the very first time in my life, I now have some hope that racial equality might be possible in the US and I would desperately hope elsewhere too. And I say this in part because environmental justice will also be needed to eradicate institutionalized injustice because it's always the poor who live near the polluting power plants, factories, ports, freeways, and the toxic residues of industrial scale, agricultural and animal husbandry operations. So if eradication of environmental injustice ever begins, all of nature will benefit, even the oceans and our beloved reefs. But that will take time. And I don't think we should wait that long. And so I end with this slide and this hope. In the spirit of the energy that this pandemic has unleashed in medical research, virtual conference planning, and perhaps now all of society, I suggest that instead of inviting those folks to come talk with us, we should just roll up our sleeves and offer our services to any engineer, sociologist, city planning, planner, farmer, or anyone whose efforts are cleansing the oceans and we should get to work. This pandemic has taught me that we don't have time to waste and big changes, even improvements can come quickly. So thank you very much. The end. Thank you so much, Judy. Appreciate your talk and your uh, perspective on where we are and where we need to go. Um, I invite our audience to go ahead and submit some of your questions uh, so that we can provide some answers and have a discussion here. Um, we are here until four o'clock um, and afterwards is trivia um, for those that submitted a team. Um, so please join. But for now, I will also share a screen so you can, we can also thank our sponsors as well. Um, so yes, the company of biologists and also Tradewind Colors for providing the platform for Zoom um, and for the products that we have available to for prizes and for just supporting all the work that Chelsea, Fran, and Judy and everyone else has done. All right, Judy, um, here's a question for you. Um, Judy, can you talk about ways to uh, reach out to city planners and engineers, as you've mentioned at the end, like how, what are some key steps that we can do as scientists to engage with those other experts? Sure. Oh, I think the answer has to be specific to wherever it is you live or are working because um, coastal communities, you know, vary in size and population density and level of, of infrastructure development from the mega cities like you know Miami and Jakarta to tiny communities and um, and islands or keys that are scarcely inhabited. So there is no one no one answer can fit all. You just have to go to the make the effort and find out you know who is doing what where you live and just hope somebody is trying to do something. Mm -hmm. um, about twenty years ago, I helped. Uh, I was a chief curator on an exhibit that eventually traveled some of the 
uh, West Indian countries after being shown at the Panama ICRS. And when we were designing the exhibit, I decided that not only would we introduce the problems that we're facing reefs, but for every problem, we would find examples of people who were trying to do something corrective in the Caribbean because it was for the Caribbean. And it was a, I just felt like I had nowhere to look when I started. And this was way before, you know, um, the internet was anything like what it is today. But it was such a joy to discover that you can always find somebody. And it doesn't matter what island or what country, there is somebody who's trying to do what's right. If it's, you know, clean up sewage or, or control runoff or put up a windmill or talk to whatever is the local planning authority about where and how buildings should be constructed or why roads shouldn't be, you know, perched on steep hillsides and left unpaved. There's always somebody who's trying to work. So you just have to find the person or people that are appropriate for the situation in which you find yourself. So that's your challenge. Mm -hmm. We'll find someone to connect and engage with. Uh, I also wanna mention that uh, being in Washington DC where I am, I know that the House of Representatives, um, there's a select, the select committee on climate crisis. They just released a report, 700 pages, um, on what can be done. And I believe it's pillar 10 is focused on oceans. And there is a section about coral reefs and restoring. So I highly recommend people to at least go to the fact sheet. Ocean Conservancy has done a wonderful job putting that together and to summarize um, some of the main points for using the ocean to actually provide solutions to climate change um, and with the emphasis on coral reefs as well. So I, I was really excited to see that, especially at this time, um, getting people's attention. Uh, Judy, I have another question for you. Um, of the changes that you've seen in your career and your lifetime in coral reef communities, which one was the most surprising to you or stands out to you the most? Well, you know, I think those Pace and Ellens that I talked about at the end were the most surprising because all my life until oh, a little over 10 years ago, I imagine my understanding of Pace and Ellens were little tiny pink and red branching structures that clung to the inner walls of um, caves and under overhangs on deep reefs. They were minute insubstantial calcifiers. And we knew they were some kind of a red alga. And they're not, they're not Prestos coral and algae because their skeleton is, is, has a different uh, mineralogy. Um, but we didn't sort of pay any attention to them unless we worked in caves and caverns and you know saw them all the time. So when they suddenly came out into the open and revealed the, that they were extremely aggressive space occupiers, um, along with being incredibly beautiful to look at, um, that was a real surprise. Um, I won't talk about my decades of accumulated grief as one member of the Caribbean reef component winked, didn't, didn't totally disappear, but became so ecologically extinct around the Caribbean. Because that wasn't a surprise, that was just you know a major series of disappointments. And they all blend together. Um, on, on your comment about Pacinellas, I just noticed that one of our attendees, Megan Williams, is a master's student over at CSU Northridge, and her master's is on Pacinellas in St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands. So it's yeah. very exciting. Um, yeah, and they're doing really exciting work, and some other exciting work is being done in, in Puerto Rico. Um, the, mm -hmm. One of the Pacinellas over there uh, forms immense masses, exp expanses, crusts. Yep, yep, just that, carpets, this like encrusting carpets over the reef. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. just obliterates the biggest mass of corals and small stands of staghorn corals. Mm -hmm. and is really destructive. 
Let's see. I think there was one more question. Oh, here's the one that we always hear often as marine scientists. Um, for people who are more inland-based, um, what can people who are away from the coast do? What is, what, what is their role? Oh, you can do so much. And that's because if you're near an agricultural area, they run off from your fields, your farm fields, and your holding ponds for your animal husbandry operation. Um, it's flowing into rivers that are flowing downstream and into the ocean. And a goodly amount of that will end up impacting a coral reef. So that's one thing you can do. Um, you can also work really hard to get the people in your community motivated to cut down on their emissions of carbon dioxide. Because um, we've all got to contribute to that or, you know, this game is over as Greta Thunberg keeps reminding us more eloquently than I ever could. Great. Um, all right, oh, is there, are there any final comments uh, Judy, that you'd like to leave before we, we bring our other organizers out uh, to thank everyone? Any final, uh, final yeah, notes? Yeah, I'll add one more comment. It doesn't matter where you live. Um, just by ingesting so many um, pharmaceuticals and, um, and uh, tablets that purport to uh, change your libido or do whatever it is, promote, promote our brain cells from atrophying or whatever it is they are, they are touting. Uh, we are eliminating all kinds of hormones and enzymes that are getting into the water supplies and they're killing uh, freshwater fishes and invertebrates. And when they get into the ocean, they're probably having uh, unknown detrimental effects on, on marine life as well. So just cutting down on consumption by people in the third world, anywhere, everywhere, wherever you live, would be an enormous benefit. Use less plastic, because micro, microplastics are, are becoming more abundant than phytoplankton as they break down into smaller and smaller pieces and waft away in aerosols or down rivers. There's lots you can do. Consume less. Thank you. All right, Chelsea and Fran, would you like to join us on screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, that sounds great. I think if you stop sharing screen, it will go back to sort of presenter view. Awesome. So hi, everyone. Um, this is our last um, live talk session um, for this week. And we just wanted to introduce ourselves and say thank you to all of you. So I'm Francesca Elmer. I'm currently an independent researcher working on stony coral tissue loss disease and sargassum and having lots of free time to help with this conference, which really was one of the reasons why it was possible to pull something like this off. And I'm Dr. Chelsea Council. I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, working with data sets of reef fish and coral surveys across the main Hawaiian islands to help guide management in the state. And in following up on what Judy was just talking about and things people can do, I do wanna give a quick shout out to a video that Fran made as a call to action. So if you're looking for more inspiration on what you can do, check out her call to action video on our YouTube playlist. Also, I have a workshop on our YouTube playlist that is on creative ways to combat the climate crisis. So if you're looking for more ideas on what you can do, check out those two videos as well as the other incredible videos on our channel. So with no further um, undo, we would like to thank all our speakers, sponsors and helpers who made it possible to have this week full of live events. We also want to thank you, our audience and participants 
for making the time to attend the talks and watch the research videos. We have more than we have more than 100,400 people registered for the conference and 80 to 200 people watching each of the live sessions on Zoom. Through the chat, we saw that many of you attended multiple events and we want to thank you for the support. We also wanna give a big thank you to the more than 100 researchers and practitioners who submitted a recorded research talk or workshop for the video conference um, portion of this conference. We were so impressed by the quality of your research and the quality of your videos. These videos will remain up on the Global Coral Reef Week YouTube channel. So please check them out if you haven't had a chance to yet. And some of the topic playlists have had over a thousand views, which I think is absolutely incredible and really speaks to how effective a virtual coral reef conference can be in sharing science. Lastly, we want to thank the local institutions who believed in our vision of virtual connected local events and were excited to host an in-person event during Global Coral Reef Week. Due to COVID-19, none of these local in-person meetings were possible this year. However, two local organizers, Encontro Reficial Brasileiro and we Healthy Reefs for Healthy People initiative moved their program online, which hopefully you were able to see or you can rewatch on YouTube. This option of having a session with local focus worked out great and enhanced the overall um, conference. Of course, for our next Global Coral Reef Week, we hope that we can actually have local in-person meetings. The core mission of Global Coral Reef Week is to design a research conference with low CO2 emissions and high access to science. Our personal struggles with justifying our CO2 emissions from attending conferences is what got us started on this journey. Along the way, we realized that our approach to having a research conference without flying to attend can also benefit researchers and practitioners with small financial budgets and limited time due to family or work commitment. Our core team consists of three main organizers, myself, Franziska, and Judy, as well as our social media coordinator, all working on a completely volunteer basis to put this event together for free. This was our first attempt at hosting a virtual conference for coral reef scientists and enthusiasts. With your support and engagement in the conference, we think that Global Coral Reef Week 2020 was a tremendous success. Of course, we also think there are many ways to grow and to do things differently for future virtual research conferences. We'll be sending out a survey to all registrants and um, ask you to let us know what you liked and didn't like in the conference. We welcome all creative ideas on ways on, to improve in virtual conferences we are also welcome to have additional team members. Please let us know if you have any ideas or are interested in helping hosting the next event. There are many things that we can all do to contribute to the battle against the climate crisis. Frankly, we need to do them all. We need to be doing them decades ago. While we will need social and political support to be effective in slowing down the climate crisis, and avoiding the worst predictions, we as coral reef scientists, managers, and enthusiasts can lead by example and show those around us that we are willing to question and to change our business as usual approach. Many of our personal and collective actions play an active part in the destruction of coral reefs, the ecosystem we love and depend on for our living. We cannot save the reefs through research alone. We also need to be part of the energy that drives the necessary unprecedented social change. We have to act now and we have to be willing to question the status quo. And we have to be willing to not wait for permission. We put this virtual conference together with no prior experience in hosting virtual events. If we were able to do this, 
then you are also able to tackle a project that will make the world a better place. Today, we ask you to pick something that you can do to help to decrease, decrease carbon, carbon emissions. Look around at your life and your community and pick something that you can do to help decrease carbon emissions. Pick something. And then do it. Thank you again um, for being part of our conference and we are looking forward to seeing you at the next Global Coral Reef Week. Thanks. Thank you. Also join us at Trivia tonight if you are signed up. We're looking forward to our last fun event.